recording. Good morning, good afternoon. Hello, my name is Guy Bigwood. I'm the Managing Director and Chief Changemaker of the Global Destination Sustainability Movement. And we're here today to talk about rethinking and rebooting smarter tourism. Um, it's an, an area that I've worked in for about 20 years, and before that I worked in the IT industry. So I was asked today to, to come and, and share some of my views, and I thought wouldn't it be great to invite a couple of very amazing women to come and share with you all the work that they've been doing, we've all been doing around the world in terms of tourism, smarter tourism and smarter events. So um, I have the pleasure to address you all from Barcelona today. Um, above a beautiful forest, as you can see. And I'd like to, uh, to, to introduce my, um, my two panelists with me here today. So we have Katarina from Gothenburg, who is the, uh, the sustainability strategist and, and strategy development manager for Gothenburg, for Gothenburg & Co, who's the destination management organization for Gothenburg, second city of Sweden, for those of you who have not been, or had the amazing opportunity to visit that. Uh, and then Pip Harley, who is joining us from Sydney, who has worked in the world of sustainability in cities for a long time. She comes from the municipality world uh, and was previously with the city of Sydney. Um, and now I have the pleasure of, of including in, in, in the team that I facilitate and lead. Um, so yeah, over to you. I don't know if you want to say hello, ladies, and, and welcome everyone. Hello, everyone. Greetings from Gothenburg. Good to be here and good to be on this panel with amazing people. <laughs> great, great, great. And Pip's on site. You're on mute, Pip. Isn't that the catchphrase of 2020? Um, <laughs> thank you very much. I was just saying, it's thanks for inviting me, Guy. It's great to be here and, and to contribute to, I think, this really important conversation. Great, fantastic. And it's nice to be involved in a, in a Smart Cities event. Um, often, well, in the past, we weren't so involved, but progressively more were being in, involved to, to get, to share, and, and, and be part of the community and, and discussion. So I've shared my screen here, and this is the theme, Rethinking Rebooting Smarter Tourism. And really it's how we leverage what we call the visitor economy. So it's more than tourism, it's the events economy as well, and how we use that to regenerate cities. Um, and then how we make that smarter, okay? So, um, okay, well, well. So as I mentioned before, I work for the GDS Movement, which is an organization uh, a global organization that works with destina destination management organizations and professionals, like cities mostly, to create flourishing and resilient places to, to visit, meet, and live in. And our mission is to, to create and uh, help to co-create sustainable circular strategies, mindsets, and skill sets. That's what we do. Today, we work with about 60, I think about 65 destinations around the world, including obviously Gothenburg and Sydney, but Washington, Montreal, from your side of the woods, um, Denver, and many other places around the world. So big and small cities. So how's the ride been for you guys lately? I'm sure like, uh, like many of us, it's been a kind of a, a tough ride um, dealing with COVID. So, you know, our industry has been particularly, particularly affected um, by COVID. Uh, here's a list of um, uh, different uh, industries and how they were projected to be affected by COVID. And this was from, I think I picked, I, I got this out in March and we were worried in March. Now we see that our, our industry, tourism and hospitality industry has been pretty much destroyed. And this is a big industry to, to, to fall really. You know, it's a $1.5 trillion industry, just the events part of this. It's about a $9.2 trillion industry in terms of contribution to GDP, the tourism industry. And if you look at that, that's, you know, that takes over and um, creates about 10% of the world's jobs. So to see that fall right now is, is a big hit. And many of you are seeing that in the cities you're living in. Um, 
And it's, we're seeing it with, with our families, our friends and our colleagues and our own organizations. So it kind of raises a key question. Is this the end of the tourism industry as we know it? Is this the end of the events industry in, as we know it? Or is this really the start of something much better? Because you know, the forest, our industry is like a forest that's burnt down and we're now with the embers. And I think we have an opportunity to rebuild the house and to rethink the future. I live in Barcelona, this is a view, a few, uh, you know, a year or so ago from the beach in summer, and that's pretty horrendous. I don't think that's really the kind of tourism I want in my city. And here's a, a picture, you know, from Barcelona that says, you know, this isn't tourism, this is an invasion. And that's one of the most polite posters that was out there, some that aren't quite there. So we saw a massive backlash. And we've seen that in Barcelona, Amsterdam, many cities around the world. And we saw that tourism was really starting to be a resource. We were starting to take our resources and consume resources and create problems. And we were focused on, on what we could do for tourism versus then what can tourism do for us. And likewise, I think now, whether you're traveling for business or traveling for an event in the future we have to challenge why and how we travel we're doing so much more online what is the value of traveling and why should we travel because there were some many negative impacts we saw some of those before but some big social impacts of how people were recruited and employed um, whether you're in indonesia or philippines or in spain and we weren't always doing the right stuff but then again, on the opposite side, crikey, 10% of the world's GDP, we were creating jobs. We were creating investment, infrastructure, social progress. We were the pre pre predominant economic force in many countries. And so that is collapsing. And so whether you look at Africa or Australia or the States, this collapse of tourism is really hurting economies. And not just the, the tourism owners, but the, the shop it's the restaurants, the people that clean the laundry, everyone's connected there. So now, as I, as I mentioned, I think it's a great opportunity for us to really think about what was the good stuff we did in the world and how we can really increase the impact of what we do to create better places to live and work in. But this requires us to imagine a new type of tourism, not the generative type of tourism whose Im images I just showed you, and not even really a sustainable type of tourism where we focus on doing less bad because we're beyond that. That's no longer good enough. We now have to have a new type of tourism, which is a regenerative type of tourism, which helps to recover and rejuvenate our cities that have been devastated by COVID. That is recovering our social infrastructure and networks, our communities, our economies, and our nature that has been damaged over the years. And so that's this new type of tourism, a regenerative type of tourism. And it's zero carbon, it's circular, it's inclusive. It's a, an economy where everyone is benefit, everyone benefits. So basically, it's a smarter form of tourism where everyone is there. And so that shift to that new tourism where we're really using tourism, where we're really using the power of the economic forces of what we do is what we're all about. And that's where we work together. So I'm going to invited Pip and Katerina to share their views on this. And this is really to kind of explore some key questions. Where does technology sit in this new view of smarter tourism? How do we involve stakeholders in our work? How do we speed and scale up innovation? How do we finance this? How do we get partners to share data with us? And really kind of thing right now is how is the pandemic affecting smart tourism? So on that note, I'm gonna stop. Um, I'm now gonna ask, hand it over to Katerina. I'll stop sharing my screen and she will take it away and introduce some of the great work that she does. Over to you, Katerina.
Thank you, Guy. So, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Katerina, as Guy introduced me, uh, and I'm the sustainability strategist at Gothenburg & Co., which is the DMO of the city of Gothenburg. Uh, and we are sort of a platform for collaboration between public and private sectors. Uh, and I will give you an introduction to Gothenburg and what we do and the uh, uh, experience and what we have learned from the pandemic so far uh, in the smart cities context. So uh, just to give you a brief uh, sort of uh, where you are in the world, uh, we are the second city of Sweden and we're on uh, the west coast, west coast close to uh, the sea uh, and we're about uh, a million residents in the metropolitan area and as you can see on my pics we we have we are urban nature destination um, just to give you a feel of where where you are uh, and also as you might know uh, Sweden had uh, sort of their own strategy in the pandemic uh, so we didn't have a a total lockdown in our society but still uh, recommendations and restrict restrictions and some restrictions struck really really hard on our industry and in Gothenburg as well since we have we have Sweden's largest tourist attraction in the amusement park and that's not allowed to be open uh, we had a fantastic summer of arena concerts that was not allowed. And we're also a, an event city and no events allowed. So it's been a really hard time for, for Gothenburg as a destination and as an urban destination as well. But since we are now in a smart cities context and not in a, in a regular tourism context, uh, I would like to sort of touch upon the logic uh, on our industry and the impact and the characteristics of the tourism industry. Uh, as Guy uh, mentioned, uh, it's a, uh, has a great economic impact. In Europe, it's about 10% of GDP and it's the third largest socioeconomic activity. Uh, and it's finally being recognized as an important industry when it comes to uh, creating growth and creating jobs um, and jobs, first time jobs for young people and people that are in vulnerable positions. Uh, and also that urban tourism is really an engine for the tourism sector uh, at large, also for the rural uh, uh, tourism. And now, uh, the pandemic struck and it really touched upon our Achilles heel when you're not allowed to meet and you're not allowed to travel because otherwise tourism is seen as a fairly stable industry in a recession, for example, but this time it really hit us hard. Uh, and the industry is really diverse. Uh, it consists of different sectors as in industry or in nature which is diverse when it's successful. Also, our industry is diverse. We have local uh, international uh, actors and also small, medium enterprises and large chains. So it's a really, really diverse sector. Um, but also one should bear in mind that it is a, uh, part of everyday life for people that lives and work in the city. And I believe that the pandemic has made it really, really clear uh, of the importance of our industry in, in urban development and in contributing to better societies and more attractive cities. Um, our industry contributes to, to uh, sort of getting uh, cities more attractive and more livable in experiences in a wide range of culture and other attractions. And also it is a, an industry that is really intense on staff. So it creates many jobs and also uh, economic growth, of course. If you look at it from a sustainability perspective, our industry is also really visible 
So in, in that way, we are a sort of a window display for smart solutions that I think could be really helpful in a transformation towards a, a, a more sustainable society and a regenerative, uh, a regenerative thinking because we can, we can uh, affect norms and, and people's behavior. I'm, I'm convinced about that. So when it comes to Gothenburg, uh, a couple of years ago, we uh, decided on a fairly bold goal, I dare say, that uh, our industry will grow really strong. Uh, but the important thing in, in this goal or this vision is the sustainability aspect of it, that we believe that sustainability is really the way forward. Uh, we also understand that to reach these, this goal, we need to reach out to other industries than the traditional tourism sectors. We need to uh, collaborate and we need innovation and we need to find new reasons for travel. travel. Uh, because we, we are in a crisis, as not only in a pandemic crisis, we have a climate crisis, we have biodiversity loss and we have... Uh, uh, unequal societies and loss of trust. So, so we have things to work on, uh, but I do believe that tourism can be a force uh, in this uh, job that we have. So uh, a little bit of uh, bragging then. Uh, I think we have come away on the sustainability issues coming out uh, as number one on the Global Destination Sustainability Index. And that has been a really important tool for us to develop, to challenge, to move forward. Uh, I'm not gonna dig more into that uh, for the time being. Uh, we use awards and benchmarks to develop uh, ourselves and our colleagues in the sector. And for 2020, we were awarded the European Capital of Smart Tourism, which I believe is a, a really great concept, the concept of smart tourism. It's not only about tech and digitalization. This sort of binds together important aspects in destination development, because if you look at the core in our industry, the attractiveness and the experiences, cultural heritage is sort of the DNA. And to really be interesting and, and long-term sustainability, you have to be accessible for all uh, and to build just an inclusive societies. Uh, and this is about also about language, of course, when you put it in a tourism perspective. When it comes to sustainability, of course, the environmental and the social dimension is really, really key. But this is also about hand tackling over tourism, which is not a big issue today, but it might come back. And it's also about, about seasonality. So these are sort of the, the frameworks uh, around the cultural heritage and creativity or the, or the DNA in a way. And then you have digitalization as a tool. And that has really become so clear during the pandemic, how important data and tech and digitalization is to move uh, both the sustainability and regeneration issue forward, but also to develop urban, urban destinations and also the tourism sector. Uh, what we have seen in our context in, in Gothenburg is that we have a fantastic IT infrastructure and people are really tech savvy, but we have an industry that is not really that mature. Uh, when it comes to, for example, if you take a, a restaurant, often the, the owner or the CEO of the restaurant is a chef uh, and he likes to cook. He is not uh, an IT guy or girl. Uh, and so we have sort of a, a challenge with the diversity of the sector, uh, which we have to handle in some way. I will sort of show you some examples of how we have uh, used uh, digitalization and, and tech tools to, uh, 
sort of move the sustainability issue forward and also some reflections on the pandemic uh, and what that has done to our organization and to our industry here in Gothenburg. Uh, a couple of years ago, we developed a travel calculator together with uh, the Academy uh, and a couple of other uh, tourism industry companies. Uh, and this is a calculator where you can actually uh, you can you can actually see what your choices make uh, in a uh, carbon footprint impact. So you can see if you choose uh, uh, a gasoline car or if you choose an electric car, you can actually see the difference in the footprint in this calculator. Uh, and also you can see other, you get other choices on, on your travel mode uh, with this uh, calculator. And, and mainly it's a way to, to help and to educate the, the individual traveler and to show that your choices have an impact and you can make uh, decisions on knowledge uh, and data. Uh, another example is uh, an accessibility app that our, uh, one of our arenas developed. And this app is aimed at people, mainly at people with hearing or seeing impairments. It gives, uh, gives them uh, flexibility within the arena and also it en enhances the experience for, for the visitor. And this is enhancing the experience for, for everyone in the arena if you, if you choose to use this uh, application. But mainly it is it's really a, a way of uh, opening uh, the sense of freedom for everyone uh, using this app uh, during an event in, in the arenas. When it comes to the, uh, um, the pandemic, uh, we really have seen uh, uh, a huge appetite for data and for business in intelligence in our industry, the different sectors. And you, we can see that the, the individual entrepreneur wants something to hold on to. And we want, to, we want the data to show decision makers uh, uh, the situation within the industry. So we have actually put quite a few um, investments in building up our, our business intelligence in the DMO to sort of help our sectors. And we have just started to explore all the possibilities with data. And, and one thing that we are looking at right now is mobile data data and uh, crowd insights. Uh, I'm sorry, these slides are in Swedish, but it's just to show you what you can actually get from big data. This is a slide that shows uh, travel to and from Gothenburg during a specific period. Uh, and then you can compare with our other, with the same time last year and, and you can follow the development. And this solution also can give you how people are moving on a city level and you can also go down on sort of a block level. And we believe that this data could be really, really interesting also in urban development uh, further on. Uh, how can we develop the city? How, how do people move around? Where are they? And so on and so forth. So this is something that we are really looking, looking into and exploring. Uh, also, we are developing a destination data platform to sort of gather and enrich data from the different sectors within our industry, but also in, in industries in the fringes uh, of, our, of the tourism sector. So this is uh, sort of <laughs> a, a sketch. Uh, on the logic of this destination data platform. And we want um, our partners to share their data and then uh, by sharing it all together, we uh, can enrich the data. And also uh, our goal is of course to 
take this to a prediction level. But we're just starting out this job uh, and the interest is really high. Uh, and we see that there is interest from both the individual entrepreneur in the sector, but we can also see that in urban development and in uh, different kinds of uh, settings, this solution could be interesting. And I would love to come back to this when we have taken it a bit further. Uh, we had hoped to have far more data from this summer than we did. <laughs> but since every, everything was sort of really not uh, <laughs> up and running, uh, we have been a bit late on in our, in our time plan, but it's really interesting to see what we can do with this uh, destination data platform. Uh, and we do believe that we need this uh, further on. And, and another aspect from the pandemic is that we can also see the need for meetings and events tech, both for helping out in hybrid meetings, because we can see that this will be a, a behavior that will continue with the hybrid meetings. And that's also from a sustainability perspective, it's, uh, it's a democratic way, you, it's more inclusive. For example, we, uh, we have an example from one large um, science conference where it's usually about five to 6,000 delegates. When this was a, a digital or hybrid conference, it was over 100,000 uh, delegates. Uh, so we, you can see that there's, a, there's an interesting uh, sort of, uh, development in this sector because you will need the physical meeting but also you can include so many more uh, and build on knowledge uh, in, when you get a, a hybrid solution but also it's uh, we're in exploring times uh, mm -hmm. uh, now so it's going to be really interesting to see how this will sort of uh, be in, in the end or, or further on. Also, you could see uh, the development of virtual site visits and how you make the museums uh, more accessible. Uh, so this is just something that our industry have started to touch upon, I dare say. And, and this is also a way to sort of widen, widen the market for for your offers, uh, I believe. Uh, so in, in the future, in the near future, we will see, uh, my guess is that we will have both uh, real life visitors, but also digital visitors uh, to, uh, to handle as a, in the tourism sector. With this said, uh, I do believe that the uh, digitalization data tech is in our industry to stay. And we do need this to uh, innovate and to find new and adapted ways of uh, reasons to travel. Uh, and the question is, what is tomorrow's cultural heritage and what will it look like? Um, this is something that is really interesting to, to explore as well and where the tech sector will take will have an important part, uh, I believe. This is from the amusement park at Halloween last year. Unfortunately, we will not see it this year, but I hope to really get to meet these zombies next year. <laughs> Thank you. This was from Gothenburg. Over and out for now. Fantastic. That's uh, amazing. Thank you very much. Um, I'm quite fortunate, actually. I'm feeling I'm in the front row listening to uh, a great, great presentation. I mean, we've been working together for ten, more than ten years, Katarina. Um, first on, on you know, your first strategy, and then I feel like I've become the student now versus the, <laughs> versus the master. And um, yeah, no, it's, it's just one of one. I think it's fascinating how in Gothenburg, the you know, for a start sustainability and smart innovation were grouped together, which is mm. exactly where I think it should be. Yeah. So I think that's a great thing and just see how you've you've been moving that forward. Um, I had a couple of questions. I'm not sure, Pip, if you've got anything that's popped up 
um, you know, let's kind of change the rules. So maybe Pip, if you've got a question, then I think of mine, and then we're. Okay, oh, great. We'll... All right. Thanks. Um, look, Katerina, I loved that presentation, and it, and it is so inspiring to hear the oh, work you. that that you're doing and, and how you're continually looking to push the boat and look for new ways of doing things. It, it really is great. One of the things I really liked was um, uh, your example of the, the travel calculator, for instance, but I think a lot of the, the digital and technology um, examples you provided is that idea that it puts the information directly into people's hands and the power that that has to influence and change people's behavior. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, I just wondered what you thought about that and how you've seen that evolve and develop as you've gone forward. Um, I think the thing is, I think you have to work on, on so many levels and you, ha you have to sort of help the, the traveler, the individual to make uh, decisions that are based on facts and based on data. I think that's something we will see more of the, the, mm. the data driven decision making, both for the individual, but also for for companies. Uh, and you also have to work on challenging the suppliers and you have to do this um, simultaneously in a way. Uh, I think because you can't leave everything to the individual. You have to help uh, the individual, uh, and also you have to show to the uh, uh, the uh, suppliers and also the um, the public uh, that they have to do their fair share. So, it, so it's a collaboration thing, I would say. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy yeah. to see say see that you like it. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I think um, looking at it from the supply side and the demand side is such an important element yeah, of, of making yeah. any change happen, right? So yeah, yeah really, really great. To but see. then also communication. You can't underestimate the power of communication. Uh, mm. and, and, that, and that's quite hard, I think, in, in when, you, when you want to communicate sustainability. You can't just communicate, oh, we're sustainable. Uh, so, so it's good to have these concrete tools to show sort of the proof uh, of, of how you, uh, your approach uh, as well. Yeah. So. yeah. I think I, you know, one of the things I like about the filter of smart, smart whatever, yeah. smart building, smart tourism, smart whatever, is that, you, you know, one of the aspects is sustainability, but one of the other aspects is just better better yeah. usability, better functionality, yeah. better experience. And sometimes in the past, you know, three of us often come from the sustainability world where, you know, we're kind of almost making things harder and not as good just to be more sustainable. Yeah. And unfortunately that doesn't work in the real world, eh? And that's why mm. I think we failed so much as a sector of sustainability in, in many areas. So mm. when you look at a Tesla, a Tesla is a better car, you know? Mm. So when you look at, you know, new forms of energy they're better because they're cheaper right you know and they so so i think really that's it you know how do we make this better tourism um, using technology that is sustainable that is more accessible that is more diverse um it delivers more you know, benefit. I, I love this example of how the um the pandemic has bought this whole notion of a hybrid event or a hybrid yeah. conference yeah. to play. Yeah. And the points that you were making there about accessibility and you know reducing the carbon footprint, I mean, that's a massive issue for Australia, yeah. is we want the economic benefit and the visitors and to, for people to come here, but it comes with a huge carbon footprint, yeah. right? There's no yeah. denying it. And so the notion that we might be able to attract people from Asia Pacific or closer to our region, but also tap into the Americas and the Europe's and so on through the use of um, what has really rapidly developed into high quality ability for people yeah. to just have, have, you know, green walls and so on is um, I think is a fabulous iteration yeah. of, of how we deliver it. And, and just the inclusivity aspects, the, the amount yeah. of content that you now have accessibility to um, and you guys in general could afford to travel, but you know, if you're in some parts of the world that can't afford to travel, now you can get the data yeah. and, and the content. So it's, it's really exciting. And I think it's, it's you know, the old phase is you can't waste a good crisis. 
Um, and exactly. I think I've seen some really great examples of how different organizations are innovating. Um, the one thing I would be interested to ask you about is you mentioned the, the challenge of small businesses and trying mm -hmm. to get them smart. So you talked about the restaurant. Okay. For example, yeah. Um, it's really interesting to see how COVID has, has forced people to use QR codes. Is there anything else that we could learn about making those restaurants or small shops smarter? How do we take them to the next level? I think um, we as a uh, platform for collaboration, mm -hmm. we have an important part uh, to play in this uh, by sort of gathering and educating and making it easier accessible, for example, the digital tools, for example, or educating on what you can, what is the value of using data and digital tools? Because in the end, this will also make them more resource efficient mm. uh, and thereby uh, more sustainable. Mm. Uh, so I think uh, platforms for collaboration, collaboration is really, really key, uh, both within a sector, but also between sectors to, to innovate. And that's also why I am uh, really um, uh, convinced that we have to reach out to other sectors, uh, especially tech sectors and IT sectors, because the, the traditional tourism sector, we don't see the solutions. We don't have the solutions mm. uh, because we are so focused on, on delivering uh, the attractive product. Uh, and that's what we really can do. Uh, and we do it exemplary but to sort of um, develop and evolve in uh, the data and digital world, I think we need other sectors to, to be part of the tourism industry. Yeah. Great, great. I think that's a good, good um, time to hand over to Pip. Um, interested for you to share a little bit about what you've been doing. Um, I'm not sure if you're gonna include it, but I'm interested in the talk if you could include also your work with C40 in this and the whole kind of theory of change. So I think that's yeah. a different approach. Um, yeah, good. sure. Yeah, happy to. And I guess um, the, 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 I guess the angle that I wanted to talk to, to about today was, um, you know, at the um, Global Destination Sustainability Movement, we're constantly talking to destinations about um, ways to develop strategy and plans and to really think about their forward vision of, of how they can um, create a sustainable destination. And so I guess I wanted to draw on um, the opportunities of using data, um, both qualitative data and quantitative data to think about informing that strategy so that it's really evidence-based strategy and also about taking a really um, systems view of that strategy development. And um, so as Guy previously mentioned, I worked at the um, City of Sydney municipality for a while and um, we partnered up with uh, Business Events Sydney, the main um, destination management organisation to to, to develop such a strategy. And so I wanted to share some of the insights from that as a bit of a case study. So um, I'll just share my screen here. Um, so yeah, um, I think, um, uh, hmm, yes, there we go. Uh, so yeah, I, I guess the, re the really first point of the strategy development in Sydney was data. This was like a really, really fundamental part of how everybody um, saw us moving forward was how do we understand where the biggest impact is coming from um, and how do we understand where the opportunities are and, the, and you know, what solutions might fit those opportunities and, and data was the basis of that. And so we started with um, and, and that's where our collaboration with C40 came in, actually. Um, so for those of you that don't know, C40 is a global network of cities 
whose mayors have made a public commitment to take action on climate change. Um, and it's an amazing network of really um, insightful and progressive uh, people who understand that cities are really at the forefront of um, what sustainable development looks like and are um, using lots of different innovative techniques and so on to try and bring about the change that we need to. So we started working um, with an organisation called uh, Kinesis, who um, are, you know, deal with data and data visualisation and so on, to um, bring together a combination of um, top-down data and bottom-up data to create this picture of what was happening in the sector. And so that involved going to the utility companies, for instance, and getting actual use data um, about gas and electricity and um, so on and water from, from the actual suppliers of those, um, of those resources to the city. And then building out a model that actually looked at um, the buildings, because 85% of carbon emissions within um, a municipality like Sydney come from buildings. And so it was about saying, what is the shape of those buildings? What is the age of those buildings? What's the size of them? How dense are they? And, and really building up that model um, on, on how those buildings are used. Um, and then taking uh, bottom-up data about uh, from individual buildings, because that utility data was at a city scale. So we took the uh, individual building data where we could get access to it to inform this really fine-grained um, uh, building level view of how occupant behavior was influencing resource use and so on. We married the two together. We married those three data sets together, actually, to create um, to create this data visualization that would help us uh, to inform strategy. So not only did it allow us to say, well, this is how much carbon emissions there are and, and water use and so on, but it enabled us to bring spatial views into it, um, to be able to look at solutions or collaborations and so on from a um, precinct uh, view, for instance. But it also enabled us to do scenario planning and to um, you know, do some modelling about what the future might look like if we got some of this right or if we didn't get right. And, and all of that stuff ultimately played into the narrative that, that we were able to develop. Hey, um, can I just jump in a second there? You yeah, said yeah, you had yeah. three put, uh, data uh, inputs. So yeah. I, I kind of missed those. So the utility, what are the, the other two? Yeah, so city scale utility data, which is yeah. like the top down data, right? Mm -hmm. So at, across the whole of Sydney, how many gigajoules of gas do we use and how many yeah. um, so on? And then um, like the model of the city. So mm -hmm. what the building typography was like and so on and, and how those buildings were used. So there was, um, there's this amazing piece of research that gets undertaken by the um, municipality, the city of Sydney each year called the, every four years rather, called the Floor Space and Employment Survey, where they mm -hmm. literally go around to almost every building in the city and take it, how many floors does it have? How many companies are operating in there? What sector do those, um, do those organizations operate in? How many staff do they have? And so they build up this really detailed view of what constitutes the city. And then the third data set was um, about individual building data. So at the, at the city, um, you know, there's a bunch of sustainability programs that are run and economic development programs and social innovation programs and that enable us to have direct relationships with associations and organizations and people within the city. And we got their data sets and anonymized them and, and pulled that together into the model. 
Wow, fascinating. Oh, I'd love to see that floor, floor space employment report oh, now. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing. The last I heard, they were going to try and do fly throughs. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow, wow. Um, but I guess the, the point I want to move on to actually is that um, uh, this, that, you know, this hard data, this resource data is only half the picture. It's only, it's only part of the story. And in developing um, a, an evidence-based strategy, it's really important to, um, to get the people side of it as well, right? And so there was this, um, like, at least a year, if not more like 18 months of consultation that went on and really deep consultation using lots of different engagement methodologies around the city with people from all different walks of life, whether they were visitors in Sydney for a day getting off a cruise ship, whether they were residents, whether they were businesses in the hotel industry, whatever it was, we got groups of people together from across the spectrum and said, and, you know, and ask them if we're going to make Sydney a more sustainable destination, you know, what are the barriers? What's stopping you from acting? What do you see as the opportunities? What resonates with you? What help do you need? And so we build up this really rich picture of what uh, essentially um, the customer needed in order to be able to work with us to take action and, and address some of the issues. Um, and, you know, that culminated in an evidence-based strategy that enabled us to go out to people with a really strong narrative that said, here's the impact of, of what this sector is having on our city at the moment, and that needs to change. And here are all the different ways we might change that, and we want you to be involved in it. And that evidence base is so crucial for credibility and authenticity and influence in terms of that narrative that you're trying to get across. Um, and um, I guess the final thing that, that, that bringing all of those different parts of data enabled us to do, or, or, or maybe the other way around actually, sorry, is the fact that we really wanted to take a systems view of what was going on here. We really wanted to understand, for instance, what all the material flows were and who the stakeholders were involved and what the resources were so that we could consider all the different levers that we needed to pull. And it, and it brought us to this really amazing place of understanding that there is no one solution to this particular problem you know, talking about sustainability in the built environment or specifically within, um, you know, tourism and, and the events industry, which is the context we're talking about here, is, you know, you can, you can go out there and enable people to put solar panels on their roofs and you can help them, um, you know, have efficient lighting in their buildings. But if people don't understand how to use those or how to um, behave in the buildings or how to procure more sustainably or or how to um, demand it or ask for it, then you're only ever addressing a small part of, of the problem. And so this interconnectedness of solutions and actors and messages is a really key part of any kind of change. And data and technology plays a really big role in bringing that systems view to light to enable you to, to really develop that strategy and, and action plan to, to take the action that's going to have a material impact. Um, yeah, yeah. So that that's 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 the case study of how Sydney um, is. I mean, I, I I certainly couldn't talk about it in past tense. It's very much a work in progress. Amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to put my hands on those data sets for Gothenburg. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's really empowering. It's really empowering. Yeah. And I think that um, it's been a great engagement tool as well. Yeah. Um, so one of the things you talked about, Katerina, was um, was the sharing of data and mm. you know how that was an important thing. And that that was really key for us as well. And um, one one of the initiatives 
that um, that came out of the um, of the strategy was the formation of this um, this group of stakeholders called the Sustainable mm. Destination Partnership, which was a whole bunch of the um, hoteliers and the um, conference producers and the you know the Sydney Opera House and the Convention Bureau and so on, who all got together and said, yeah, okay, we're we're going to collaborate and work together to try and bring this strategy about. And one of the fundamental things when we first got them in the room is we said, you have to be prepared to share your data. Yeah. And, um, you know, it needs to be transparent. And uh, if you can't sign up to that principle, then this isn't going to really work. And we were a bit frightened about that, but people did it. They could see the value in it oh. ultimately. Oh. Yeah, you have to build the trust. Uh, yes. And, I mean, and sort of, it is that giving is getting in a way. Yeah. So trust and transparency and, and, and the uh, approach that giving is getting. And I also yes. really like the no, there's no one solution. Mm. Uh, and it's a bit like in, in nature to, to connect to the regeneration. And, and I'm thinking of uh, Janine Benyus and the biomimicry. Uh, mm -hmm. that to get be inspired of the system solution in nature and it's about diversity and interconnectedness as well uh, no matter what in a way and no matter what context so yeah really inspiring thanks pip mm -hmm. wow it's good I've, I've got lots of lots of thoughts and questions there <laughs> um Time, time is running out. I guess um, kind of question for me is, is how do you get people to share data? You know, because you, mm. you mentioned that, you know, there's, <laughs> that's what we need to do. But are there, are there tips and tricks? Because I find that a lot of people, you know, the people want to share the data aren't the people you want the data from often. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm. Um, look, I think I would um, just reiterate what, Katarina said a minute ago about trust. That's such an important element of it. And I think, um, you know, in the example of Sydney that I just presented, the fact that it was um, obvious that uh, we had gone out and spent a lot of time and effort and money on really developing this robust strategy meant people took us seriously and that went a long way to building that trust relationship. Um, and, and I think also that idea that we were willing to share our data. And so, you know, it was that leading by example type of thing. Um, and I guess we also put parameters around it as well. So mm -hmm. look, within this closed room, we're gonna be able to see yeah. it, but whenever we present it externally or we use it for strategy development, it's gonna be aggregated, it's gonna yeah. be anonymized. Exactly. And some of those really key principles were really important for enabling that sharing. And I think that's a again. brilliant leeway into what I wanted to present kind of next is about the index and the work that we've all been doing together because that was kind of what we decided all those years ago. I think 2010 we had an idea, Katerina, in that we wanted to, to take um, the whole of Scandinavia on a journey with what we were doing in Gothenburg and Copenhagen at that point. And then after a while we realised we didn't have any way to, to kind of benchmark what Gothenburg was doing or what Copenhagen was doing. So we started to create a, um, a system and that became the, uh, the GDS index. So I'm gonna share that with you um, and talk to you a little bit about this. And let's share the screen. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Cool. So, um, so we created a system that we launched and tested and piloted for a few years in Scandinavia. And then in 2015, we took it global, which it's been working now. So 60 something cities are using this. So it's a benchmarking system where the cities put in data. Um, uh, so they submit data based on four different areas. So first thing is how um, smart and sustainable the city is in terms of environmental performance, wastewater, energy, things like that. 
the city performance, corruption, inclusiveness, gender equality, things like that. So we put that data in, then we collect data from the suppliers. Um, so how well the hotels are doing, the airport, the restaurants, even the universities are doing around sustainability strategy policy and performance. Uh, we use certification as quite a, an important method here to, to judge how well a, a destination is doing in terms of what percentage of suppliers are certified. And then lastly, we look at the destination management organization that is often is part of the city, but not always. It could be a public private organization or, or even very rarely, but it could be a private organization totally in some parts of the world. So we look at their strategy, their capacity building, their engagement activities, their communications activities. So cities complete all of that off. There's a very fancy platform called Omni that collects all this data and allows them then to benchmark against each other, uh, against their own, themselves over years uh, and to start to draw conclusions and insights. Um, and so you can see who, who's, who's the best in what particular area, um, and then you can start to learn from that. And then we build this on top of this, a kind of, uh, at the moment, it's fairly manual and, and driven by consultants, and but progressively more will be AI driven, the insights. And so what insights can we find that can help you? So if you're Sydney, there may be something from Gothenburg that could help you, you know, so Katarina now is focusing on a data platform. She could learn a lot from what Pip's done. Uh, and likewise, we may be able to learn from similar cities or often, you know, a Cape Town or a city in Africa could learn from a New York and vice versa. It doesn't always have to be similar cities, which is kind of surprised us often, whereas often the innovation comes from the edges and from really different places. So cities get these reports and then they start to ultimately create a performance improvement program and improve performance. And here's the graph over the cities that are involved of how improvement has, has changed over the last few years. So there's, a, there's more than a 20% increase in performance over this period. Um, and this is pretty exciting because actually it's got much harder over the years. So the actual, if we had the same criteria, I think it would be about 50% improvement, but the criteria has got much tougher. So it's actually, um, is reduced down to 20%, which I think is phenomenal for the work that we've been doing. Um, so yeah, so that's what we're doing. And then how do cities use that? They take the data, they put it on their website, they use it for marketing, they use it for engagement activities, they use it to set strategic challenges and things like that. Um, and so, yeah, that's a kind of a little bit of, of, of the journey of, of the index. Um, I'm not sure if either of you, if you've both been using this over the period, wondered if you had anything to kind of share that you think is useful. Uh, if I could share something, I think it's really uh, uh, a good thing that you have to collaborate uh, to sort of uh, get a, a position in the index. Yeah. You have to collaborate the city, the private sector suppliers and the GMO. And I think that's a really, really nice thing because then you can actually push things forward as well. So the collaboration side of it, um, I really like. Um, yeah, I would definitely second that. That, that was um, a key uh, thing for Sydney. I think also um, that third party endorsement is really valuable. It's not just us saying we're yeah. sustainable. It's not us putting that label on ourselves and saying, hey, look at us. It's somebody else objectively against the set of credible criteria saying, yes, this is good, you know, all right, you could do a bit better here. But it's it's that third party endorsement is so, so important oh. for actually, um, you know, selling the message to people that what you're doing isn't just greenwashing. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, thank you. Um, invitation to any of you from cities out there, you can participate. It's a, it's a fairly low cost model. Um, it's a great learning all around the world with other cities. Uh, we'd love to invite new cities to participate and progressively more, we're, we're including more concepts of, of smart uh, tourism, smart event management, smart destination management and regeneration. Um, 
So I guess we're kind of coming to the end of our time is up. Um, I'd like to throw it out for you for kind of one last word, uh, one last thought about, you know, what is the future of smart tourism? What are, what do cities out there who are listening, should, what should they be focusing on? What would you recommend, Katarina? Um, collaboration, sustainability and... Uh, the digi but don't forget don't forget the people yeah okay so technology innovation but don't forget the people is right mm. key especially now in covid pip look i think that whole notion of using technology to put the information into people's hands to inform their decisions at the point where they're making them is so so powerful you know, being able to put a sustainability rating into the hotel listing on Expedia, you know, that's going to inform people and allow them to make informed decisions. And I think data and technology has such an important role to play in that. Yeah, I love that. And I think um, we talked about earlier today in another session how most people get the importance of sustainability and inclusiveness and things like that. We don't you know, we're going to a different phase where we don't really have to convince people anymore and educate them on the why. We just to help, the have to help them the on the, on yeah. the how. Yeah. And yeah. That's, that's our roles as, as professionals in this sector. And that's a really exciting opportunity. So I'm going to finalise with one last image here, which is um, a report we've just launched uh, last week um, with Marriott International and IMEX, which is a very large trade show in this in this space, in the, in the tourism and event space. It's called the Regenerative Revolution. Um, it's really a, a report about how nature can help us innovate. Katarina already mentioned about biomimicry. We're starting to look at that and starting to think of what regeneration means and frameworks for getting there. Um, an interesting first step. This is, I'd say, chapter one. Uh, there definitely needs to be a chapter on using data for regeneration. You've kind of <laughs> given me a new example there and thoughts of how we can work together. So I'll be calling you ladies on that one. Um, <laughs> you can download that. Uh, come to our website, gds.earth. Um, we, uh, we thank you all for listening. Uh, thank you, both of you. Really enjoyed the, the session and uh, wishing everyone good times and as I, I heard yesterday keep positive and stay negative <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys thank you Katharina. thank you thank you Pip. thanks